Thank you. Uh, welcome to the IDMP webinar. We're very pleased to provide you with this update. And um, we are planning that uh, we're to have um, subsequent uh, uh, webinars on this topic as uh, developments um, occur. So uh, what is IDMP? The International Organization for Standardization, ISO, initiated a joint project to develop the IDMP standards and technical specifications in collaboration with other organizations, including the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, and with the uh, United States uh, Food and Drug Administration. So what are these five separate uh, standards that were developed? One was medicinal product identification, two, pharmaceutical product ID, substance identification, dosage form and route of administration, and units of measure. Collectively, the five standards were designed to internationally harmonize uh, specifications for the identification, description, and exchange of medicinal products between regulatory agencies, pharmaceutical companies, and manufacturers. The standards support the global regulatory activities related to the development, application submission, and the post-approval life cycle management of medicinal products. So what are the potential benefits of IDMP? Well, the FDA protects and promotes the health and safety of the public by enhancing the availability of safe medicinal products. FDA continues to focus on the challenges of global supply chain and foreign sourcing of medicinal products. FDA relies on the support and commitment of international regions to ensure the safety of medicines uh, we use. FDA understands the domestic and international health benefits of the unique and unambiguous identification and exchange of information that describe a medicinal product. IDMP should improve pharmacovigilance by uniquely identifying specific medicinal products described in ICSRs, and to improve the global detection of safety signals from medicinal products referenced in adverse events. Just an aside, FDA receives over 1 million safety reports per year into its adverse event system called FAIRS. IDP, IDMP should allow the identification of pharmaceutically equivalent products across regions that would support mitigation of drug shortages. IDMP should facilitate the global communication of medicinal product data. And finally, IDMP should promote greater interpretation and understanding of data and information by using harmonized terminologies and standards, as well as a common electronic exchange, such as HL7 FHIR, among companies, regulators, and other stakeholders. So what is FDA's approach to ISO IDMP standards? It is important to note, it is important to note uh, that the US FDA does not have a regulatory requirement to implement or use the ISO IDMP standards. No, there is no statute or regulation mandating IDMP in the United States. However, as I mentioned, the FDA sees great value in collaborating internationally on the use of these standards for global pharmacovigilance. FDA has established an approach to IDMP. FDA evaluated the extent to which terminologies and standards currently used in regulatory submissions across the medical product development lifecycle conform to the data concepts in each of the five ISO standards. FDA concluded that the US Drug Code, NDC, for MPID conforms to the 11615 standard. Concluded that uh, the unique ingredient identifier, 11238, conforms to um, the ISO, for substance, conforms to the ISO 11238. 
we um, concluded that for the um, units of measure, the UCOM standard conformed to 11.240. For FDA terminology, for, for um, uh, 11.239, the FDA terminology for dosage form does not conform to the ISO 11.239. And we'll uh, talk about this a little bit more later. As far as the pharmaceutical product ID, um, this is an algorithm generated uh, that generates a number based on input from the other ISO standards, and TJ will discuss this uh, in more detail uh, later. So um, we've developed an IDMP roadmap. Um, it's not a timeline because, as I said, we don't have a mandate um, for IDMP, but this gives you a good uh, idea of the amount of work that's been done since 2012 and when the ISO standards were published. And um, this work is ongoing. This is a very complex initiative uh, across these five standards. And so it will take um, quite a while before um, there's full implementation in major regions of, of the world. And this would just give you an idea of some of the work that would be going on in 2020. Now I want to turn it over to my colleague, TJ Chen, who will uh, give you an update on MPID, PHPID, substance ID, and units of measure. Thank you, Ron. So in the next few slides, I would like to share with you um, what we what did we do to assess the ISO IDMP standards and how do we conclude that we can conform to the standards. So first, the ISO 11615 medicinal product information. The title for this standard is Data Elements and Structures for the unique identification and exchange of regulated medicinal product information. The standard defines the data elements, structures, and the relationship between the data elements that are required for unique identification of medicinal product at product level, package level, and batch level, with the objective to support activities of regulatory agencies worldwide. And the activity as described by um, Ron earlier, that include the development, registration, and the life cycle management of medicinal product, as well as pharma uh, pharmacovigilance and risk management. The standard also defines uh, electronic message specification to support reliable exchange of medicinal product information among interested parties. After detailed review of the ISO 11615 standards and the CFR Title 21 Part 207, we concluded that the requirements of assigning a unique NDC code to a medicinal product align with the criteria of assigning unique ISO, IDMP, uh, ISO MPID. Many of you in the audience may already know that the NDC code has three segments as described at the bottom of the, this slide. The first segment is a, is a labeler code, followed by a product code, and then followed by a package code. The first two segments together uh, can be used to identify product at medicinal product level. It's called MPID. And then the whole NDC code can be used to identify product at package level, also known as PCID, as described in ISO 11615. So first, the um, general considerations, section 8.2.1, ISO 11615 2017 uh, edition. It says that um, each authorized marketed product a unique MPID must be assigned. 
the MPID is supplement to any existing authorization number as described by a regulatory agency in a region. This is to contribute to improve patient safety by allowing a unique identification of medicinal product worldwide. So how could a regionally assigned medicinal product ID be unique worldwide? The ISO 11615 standards specify a pattern or a segment pattern, a three segment pattern. Um, a, a country code, two-digit country code, followed by a marketing author authorization holder segment, and then followed by a medicinal product code segment. And we will examine how the marketing authorization holder segment can align with label code, and how the medicinal product code align with NDC product code. So ISO 11615 3.1.41 uh, terms and definition defines that marketing authorization holder is an organization that holds the authorization for marketing a medicinal product in the region. So basically that's some organization that can sell or marketing a product. The CFR 21 part 207 paragraph 33C defines who must obtain an NDC code or NDC label code. It basically is anyone who engage in manufacturing, repackaging, relabeling, or private label distribution of a drug must apply for NDC code. So based on this definition and uh, regulation, it's clearly that we can establish the marketing authorization holder is compatible with what we call the labeler in NDC code. And then in section 8.2.4, it goes down to describe what are the attributes that are required for uniquely identify medicinal product and also what change would trigger a new medicinal product code to be assigned. And as highlight in red, it also say as applicable per a medicinal regulatory agency's process fees. Those attributes are A, marketing authorization, B, legal, legal status of supply when you switch between prescription to over OTC, C, the product name, D, dosage form, E, active ingredients, and the strengths. And then F, device, when it comes to a combination product. And then G, indications. And this is where that applicable uh, come into play. As many of you may already know, aspirin has been marketed as a painkiller. Uh, it's used to reduce pain, swelling, and fever. And lately, it also been marketed as a pain thinner. That um, with this new indication, aspirin does not get a new NDC code. And now we look at CFR 21 part 207, paragraph 35, um, what change required to a new NDC. The requirement says that when those items below changed, then you need to assign a new product code. So the items are one, Drug name, two, ingredient and strength, three, dose form, four, change of the status between prescription to non prescription, and number five, change of the intended use between human and, and animal. Now, ISO 11615 concentrate on human pharmaceutical, so this is uh, out of scope for ISO 11615. Number six, um, go into the drug characteristics such as size, shape, color, imprint, flavor, and scoring. Now, ISO 11615 does not call out those data, uh, those as attribute for, uh, for a new MPID assignment, but the data model does 
allow you to capture those information. And so with that, we can establish that the product code described in this 207.35 also align with um, ISO 11615 product code segment attribute requirement. Also, the 207.35 go further to describe that whenever the package size or type change, then the package code need to change, which will trigger a new NDC code. Now, this also align with ISO 11615 package medicinal product, also called the PCID um, assignment. Now, the exchange standard. ISO 11615 stated that this document has been developed in conjunction with common product model CPM and structured product labeling SPL in HL7. HL7, SPL, and CPM under revision uh, to support ISO 11615 uh, when the ISO standard was developed. F FDA has been using SPL for labeling and drug listing and registration submission. FDA also determined that the required component in the ISO 11615 are captured in the SPL submission. Um, the only exception is indication. Indication is not required, uh, it, but it can be captured prospectively via the regulatory submission. So with that, we establish that current SPL process can support the MPID exchange. EMA, uh, European Medicinal Agency, also uh, decided that they will go to the HL7 fire to develop the information exchange standard. FHIR is a new standard, so uh, EMA decided to go that route. Uh, FDA is collaborating with EMA and would test the new standard to make sure it adhere to the TS20443. Next is the PHP ID. PHP ID, as Ron described, is a, is a system generated code by an algorithm based on the substance, strength, and dosage form. A given medicinal product would have a set of PHP ID at level one substance, level two substance plus strength, level three substance and dosage form, level four substance, strength, and dosage form. With this variable substance uh, PHP ID, a user can associate other medicinal product with same or similar pharmaceutical composition. And this is very important to address drug shortage or pharmacovigilance. FDA currently use, is generating a regional PHP ID that would allow us to link brand name product and a generic product. Um, EMA, oh, sorry, let me jump, I jump a little bit. Uh, in 2000, 18 May, WHO UMC presented a concept paper um, try to be the maintenance organization to generate and maintain a global PHP ID. As I mentioned earlier, FDS generate regional PHP ID to link brand name and generic product. But like Rank mentioned earlier, in order to take the full advantage of this um, global MPID, we need to establish global PHP ID so that we can associate product worldwide. And in order to do that, we need to have a harmonized or at least commonly recognized pharmaceutical dosage form and substance in order to generate this global substance ID. Um, there's a technical and policy workgroup meeting scheduled by WHO in late August 2019 with multiple regulators participating and we will go into the detail on that during the meeting. Substance ID. Uh, the title for 11238 is Data Elements and Structure of for Unique Identification and Exchange of regu Regulated Information on Substance. 
the sub the standard goes into in depth specification on how to uniquely identify a substance, whether it is a chemical or polymer or structure diverse. It also drill down to uh, what they call specified substance based on many variables such as manufacturer, manufacturing procedures, impurities, and also, I mean, a lot of detail that Larry would later describe, um, will provide more detail on that. FDA have been using a unique ingredient identifier, uh, UNI, which is compatible with 11238, and also collaborating with NCI and other regulators to develop an open source global substance registration system, GSIS. The system has been uh, installed in FDA and has been in use. Again, Larry is going to go into the detail on both substance and GSRS. And here's a quick update on fire. Um, in 2018, January, e EU endorsed the use of fire as the message standard for medicinal product information and substance information. You can see the hyperlink. Uh, when you go to that hyperlink, it would open up the announcement by EMA. HL7 BRNR Working Group is now working to develop the 11. 238 substance specification and 11615 medicinal product specification uh, resource. The medicinal product resource is developed in collaboration with a pharmacy group too. And hope we are expecting uh, to ballot the standard by January 2020. And unit of measurement, 11240. The UCAM code has made. Uh, Ron mentioned earlier, uh, has been used in SPO submission and is an ISO 11240 compliant standard. And we are now using the UCAM code and the syntax for the dosage strengths in SPO submission. So with that, I'm going to turn to Ron to uh, go further on the dosage form. Thanks, TJ. Okay. Let's see. So um, I said that we were going to talk about uh, dosage form in route of administration uh, a little later because, um, as I said, um, FDA's terminology does not uh, conform to the uh, FDA uh, to the, um, uh, the standard. Uh, so based on our review of an analysis of uh, the ISO 11239 uh, standard for dose form in route of administration and its uh, companion technical spec, the um, 2440, uh, we concluded that the uh, EDQM terminology for dose form uh, does conform to the standard. And you could see the link there. FDA uses um, what is known as the FDA terminology for SPL. Um, this terminology has been used for many years um, for the content of drug and biologics labeling, uh, for drug establishment registration and listing. And you can see the link there that will bring you to uh, the page on our website that will provide uh, a lot of information. In addition, the FDA terminology is used by the CDISC uh, controlled terminology for STTM in clinical trials. So CDISC um, is a global standard for uh, study data, and it has its own controlled terminology, but uh, it um, uses much of the FDA terminology for SPL that is curated at the uh, National Cancer Institute uh, Enterprise Vocabulary Service. And you can see the link there um, to see the full uh, NCI terminology. Uh, so as I mentioned, based on our review of uh, specifically the technical spec for uh, 11239, the 2440, the FDA terminology does not conform 
to the 11.239 standard for use in international IDMP. Just to give you a little snapshot of uh, what we're uh, talking about and what the analysis uh, looked like, um, as I mentioned, uh, we work closely with our sister organization, um, the uh, National Cancer Institute, uh, EVS. Um, we determined that of the 166 dose forms that are listed in the FDA terminology, only 36 of those terms mapped one-to-one -to, -one to the over 484 EDQM um, pharmaceutical dosage forms. So this is a major concern if EDQM uh, is considered the central terminology that regions need to map to uh, with their specific terminology. This gives you uh, a quick snapshot. On the far left is um, uh, a list of the FDA terminology for capsule types. And you see on the far right the list of capsule types for EDQM. And you see uh, the circled areas where there's a capsule dose form for uh, FDA terminology but there is no capsule dose form for EDQM. They call their capsule, their uh, dose form capsule hard or capsule soft. Um, the, there is uh, much granularity in the EDQM terminology set uh, compared to the FDA uh, terminology set. So this is just a basic example. There's obviously other examples as well. And you can take a look for, your, for yourself because these terminologies are readily available. So um, many uh, regional terminologies um, may not conform to the 11239 standard for dose form and route of administration. And as implemented uh, via the technical specification 2440. So 11239 is the overall standard but the technical spec 2440 gives, um, provides a lot of detail on what your terminology set needs to have for it to um, uh, be in conformance. Um, this certainly could impact on the ability to generate uh, the international PHP IDs as TJ um, alluded to uh, a few minutes ago. We do need to have a central terminology this is clearly stated in the technical spec 2440. Um, it states that regional terminologies um, need to map to that central uh, terminology set. Um, and as noted here, um, the international, uh, for international PHP ID, uh, levels three and four would not be possible uh, for FDA if, in fact, um, the EDQM terminology set was um, defined as the central terminology. So um, where are we? Next steps. Uh, certainly it's important, as uh, TJ uh, mentioned, to have um, a unified um, a dosage form, a unified uh, substance uh, code, and that because those two uh, plus units our inputs into the calculation of the PHP ID. So um, the ISO uh, technical spec 2440 is scheduled for ballot for systematic review through the ISO um, process. If it's approved for systematic review, the relevant stakeholders will need to review the technical spec with the goal to identify or to develop a central set of dose form terms that can be used by all regions or that can be mapped to uh, by regional terminologies. Um, FDA has um, collaborated with EMA uh, extensively for uh, a number of years. And this is just um, a snapshot 
of some of those areas of uh, some of those areas of, of focus as GSRS, which Larry will talk about in just a minute or two. Um, on as TJ said, on fire uh, resources for exchange of information, and also uh, we're collaborating uh, with EMA and WHO um, to see whether the um, WHO could maintain uh, these various global identifiers. Hold on a sec to, I don't know, can they see the resources slide? Oh, there we go. Um, all right, this is just a slide. You could take a look at this. The link is there um, where you can go to the FDA's website on IDMP. And uh, I think an important uh, organization, if you're not uh, aware of it, um, there it is. Um, it's called the IPRP, International Pharmaceutical Regulators uh, Program. And I, uh, uh, I encourage you to go to that website. There is a IDMP work group that uh, FDA participates in with um, many uh, probably over 40 or 50 uh, regulators uh, around the world. And it's a site where we are about to post a frequently asked questions document and a work plan for uh, the balance of 2019. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And now I want to turn it over to Larry Callahan, who will provide an update on GSRS. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ron, and, and the organizers uh, for inviting us to this meeting. I mean, a lot of the GSRS, um, again, was developed with small business in mind and things like that. So we, um, we really appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys to see if this is something hopefully that's a bit useful to you or will be useful to you. Again, this is a really collaborative project. This, this first slide illustrates we've worked very closely with the EMA. This has been a very close collaboration with the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NIH's newest institute, and they've developed part of their software along with FDA developers, and, and they're actually distributing the, uh, the public version of the software. And we've, the Dutch agency has also been leading the effort in, um, in uh, Europe, and we're actually meeting with them for the next couple of weeks to kind of um, agree on a lot of things and stuff like that. So we really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to present to you guys. Um, Again, the, an outline of the talk. I'm not going to get into the adverse event data. It's, it's a little bit out of scope, but I'll get into the rest of it and do um, a pseudo demo of the system since, you know, my computer, uh, we have ex strong access control at FDA, and uh, I have, and, and this computer doesn't really have access to the GSRS. So usually I do do a demo, a live demo, or a debugging session sometimes, but, uh, but uh, to, um, to the system to give people an idea of what the system can do. Um, so the next slide, I don't think I have to tell anybody in a line that you know, FDA really has the most important and valuable repository, you mean biological and product data, but again, sometimes there's limited integration. Some of that's due to the submission process, although the ECDD has really helped a lot in sort of a common format. It's still mostly PDFs and not in databases, and it's very difficult to compare across applications and things like that. Different centers sometimes also have different systems. There's different contractors who develop systems. And again, the business process probably isn't optimal for, for the organization of regulatory and scientific data. Um, again, the amount of information is you know, increasing tremendously with all the new methods and things like that that we're getting. We're getting a lot of, um, we get enzyme and receptor profiling for nearly every small molecule that comes in, and even with antibodies, we get a lot of receptor profiling. We're starting to get genomics information, eventually epigenomic information. We're trying to link into electronic health records. And again, we get many CMC changes over the course of the lifetime of a, of a given product. Substances we think are, you know, are a key or the key linchpin for organizing scientific and regulatory information. And the GS attempts to define substances consistently and unambiguously based on what we think are scientific principles. And what we do, we assign what's called a uni, and probably some of you are familiar with it, which is a unique ingredient identifier, and we permanently assign that to a given uh, material. Uh, and it's really independent of nomenclature. The names, of course, you know, change quite a bit over the course of development. So the uni will stay with that compound, you know, throughout its entire lifetime, regardless of the context, whether it was in an application, whether it was in a um, in an NDA, is an active ingredient. The same uni is tied to that same substance, uh, hopefully permanently. 
Um, again, organizing information, uh, the approach to the IDMP was gone into a little bit, but it really is to try to get data organized prior to submission or at least after submission and product approval so that we get a lot more fielded data in. We try to develop a lot of controlled vocabulary, and we think that's better than uncontrolled vocabulary. And again, as, as Ron indicated, you know, codes oftentimes are better than names in and, and trying to put things together. I mean, it's always hard to map names to one another and things like that, so you have to really sometimes you know, base things on definitions, not on, on necessarily nomenclature. And currently, all substances and medicinal products are, are assigned, should be defined, uh, defined and assigned to permanent ID, not only active ingredients, but also inactives and, and, and things like that, and adjuvants and things like that for vaccines. Um, the goals of the IDMP project, again, was to get a common data structure. That's been talked on a little bit. We hope it will enhance pharmacovigilance, um, enhance quality, uh, prevent drug shortages. And, and again, we hope this tool that we're promoting will promote drug development. That's one of the reasons why NCATS is involved in it, is they, they really want small companies, since they're really the crux of um, of drug development now, oftentimes, to be able to have a system that they can use and hopefully help them without you know, spending a great deal of money on it. Um, again, we think it will assist in a lot of other things. We think a global ID for substances and pharmaceutical products um, is, is will important and be able to tie a lot of data together from EHRs. Again, this again just reiterates the points I, I made in the previous slide. And again, we hope to have a system where we can automatically exchange, uh, exchange data. Again, what's a substance? So at the FDA, we get a lot of things in. You, you know, we get a recombinant salmon in, and that, in some sense, is a substance. So we, you know, I'm a chemist, and I think of substances as more molecules and things like that. But again, the the range of products and materials and products is much broader than just you know ch simple chemicals and things like that. So we really the 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 previous definition of substances, if we go back to Aristotle, was something that has matter and capable of separate existence. So really, it's anything that has a unit of matter that we can quantitatively measure has the potential to be a substance. Uh, we basically divided um, the material world up into five bins, which would be chemicals, proteins, nucleic acids, polymers, and what we call structurally diverse material, which would be that salmon that uh, we, 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 you know, we, we've approved. And um, then we also have mixtures. Um, we base substances are, defined, are, are not defined based on use. So the same substance can be an active ingredient. It could be an impurity in, in another application. It could, be a, um, it could be an inactive ingredient. Again, and we define it based on what it, we think it is. Uh, and it can be manufactured or isolated using different methods. It's really what you end up with, although sometimes you know, we have to capture a bit of process information to really define things. Um, so that's it. Again, we have five groups of elements, chemicals, proteins, uh, nucleic acids. Um, and uh, again, we define proteins by their amino acid sequence, glycosylation, any modification chemicals by their molecular structure. And again, nucleic acid and proteins are somewhat similar. Polymers are sometimes somewhat difficult. We uh, we capture monomers. The, the you know is it is it the geometry of them? Um, you know the overall molecular weight. You know sometimes two or three types of molecular weight. And also for biopolymers, the um, the source of the uh, of the biopolymer. A structurally diverse material, we rely predominantly on taxonomic or an, an anatomical and then fractionation, sometimes physical or biological properties to distinguish different substances and also modifications and things like that. So th those are the five bins. Every substance has to get put in an individual bin. It can be in multiple bins. We have the, uh, in our system, we have the potential to have an alternative definition. So a small peptide can be described as a, as a protein or peptide and also as a chemical. So we have that flexibility in the current system that we use. Um, and again, so why register substance? Well, I mean, you know, to keep me employed is, is one reason, but uh, that's probably not sufficient. Um, you know, but, uh, um, you know, you really want to tie substances to regulatory submissions. Um, and uh, again, you know, we want to know, have we seen this substance before? So, you know, we can anticipate what may or may not be the problems with it. Uh, we want to, um, you know, we want to track biomarkers. Biomarkers, in many instances, are substances, so we want to be able to track that. We want to, you know, have related information. We want to get the starting materials and, and, and processing materials and impurities. Uh, and we tie substances to other substances, like is this substance a metabolite of something else? Is it a drug target? Is it an impurity of another substance? Uh, you know, what, what are the transporters that a substance can indicate? And, we, you know, we started capturing that information 
in the GSRS. We're not exhaustive, or but again, eventually we hope to organize the data so this comes in in a structured format and we don't have to re-enter it uh, by hand. That's the whole idea of the system is to give it to companies. You can put it behind your firewall and then you know capture all this data in a, in a manner that we'd be able to accept it in a more organized fashion. Um, and again, we want to tie substance to products. That's a major thing. TJ and, and Ron both touched on that. And, and again, it's, it's important to know, you know, the same, you, usually the thing causing problems in, in adverse events is a substance. It could be the substance, the intended active ingredient in a product. It could be a metabolite. It could be an impurity occasionally. So we really want to know, you know, what are the substances causing different adverse events. We want to be able to predict and prevent drug shortages. Oftentimes shortages are due to an inactive ingredient all of a sudden becoming unavailable somewhere or a starting material. So to know what these things are, we can we, we can maybe mitigate somebody's situation. Of course, we want to tie substances to the manufacturer, you know, who makes it, where they make it, how they make it, and hopefully coordinate inspections and testings. Uh, out this again, and we tie it to a bunch of other information. I'm not going to go over it, but we're starting to capture some of this stuff into the uh, into the GSRS, and um, and that's one of the you know one of the we think the positive things about it. Uh, again, so we have the substance defined, which is sort of the essence of it. But then we also need higher levels of information on a substance, and some of those other areas touched on it. We need to have multiple substance ingredients, cymethicone, a lot of colorants, flavorants, where you're mixing two substances together, but you're marketing it as an ingredient. So we call that SSG1. We want to capture different properties on a given material or substance. Is it, um, is it the crystallinity of it? Is it a different polymorph? It, I mean, when it's in the body, it doesn't know what the polymorph is oftentimes. But again, for a lot of other, for quality aspects, stability, and bioavailability, the polymorphs are, are fairly important. And we're, again, we're just starting to implement this level at FDA. We, we've implemented a little bit, but it's, it's really under development now. Um, that's what we call SSG1 in the standard. There's a need, again, to tie it for a, to a, a manufacturer. And again, we do that in two ways. We have kind of a manufacturer light, like who made it. Maybe the sites where they made it would be SSG2. Uh, and then we would uh, get into the details of manufacturing in SSG4. And we're still trying to you know, work out how that data will get structured. Um, and uh, what we did in the second version of the ISO standard for substances is we separated out manufacturing and specifications. So you can, you know, change specifications without changing manufacturing or change manufacturing without changing specifications. We'd be able to keep track of them independently somewhat. Uh, so that's the specified substance. This is the overall model of a specified substance. All specified substances, of course, map back to a uh, to a substance, and then uh, group four would map to you know one of the the, the other types and things like that. So that's uh, that's uh, what we're doing. Unis currently um, they're implemented at the FDA at the substance level. They're required for all ingredients, as TJ and perhaps Ron mentioned as well. Anything listed in SBL has to have a Unicode. Nearly all drug targets have Unicodes. We're signing Unicodes as INDs come in. Eventually, we hope companies will pre-register or obtain a uni shortly after submission, and then and then you know use that uh, to um, you know throughout the, the 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 application process, so we're able to keep track of everything. Uh, they're not explicitly listed in the orange book, purple books, or green book, but again, everything's sort of based on that. Um, what's GSRS? What's well, a software system with a, a bunch of data in it? Uh, it registers and defines substances. It's since we sort of developed the ISO standard, myself, Frank Switzer, and Herman Dietrich were the primary editors on the substance module. And uh, so we, we hope we've sort of built it off what the GRS was, and we've ad adapted the GSR a little bit to the standard, but the standard was really based predominantly on what we were doing at FDA. We assign a permanent uni to each substances, and we, because again, SPL uses uni, our adverse event systems uses uni codes, um, we're able to tie products, applications, adverse events, and clinical trials together. We have a limited amount of quality information and LADMR information in the system. We're trying to beef that up and enter it, uh, enter more, and I'll show you a little bit of that uh, as we go on uh, when I do a sort of a pseudo demo. 
Um, so that uh, it, it, GSRS is part of the IDMP effort too. And again, we think a global marketplace for ingredients requires a global system. The standard's complex, difficult, and expensive to implement. That's why we decided to do it open source and make it freely distributable. You know, so every regulatory agency can have the same system. I mean, there's a lot of chem there, there, there's not a lot, but there's a few chemical registration systems out there. There are some that even combine proteins, but there's none of them that really combine chemicals, proteins, nucleic acids, and polymers, and then structurally diverse materials. So it's, it's somewhat of a unique database in, in, in that sense that we, we tie all this stuff together. And we think that when we have a global database and, you know, we'll have better data, less redundancy, more data, and hopefully less mapping uh, of things to each other. Again, it's a software application. It's freely distributable. Um, you know, some big companies are using it. I mean, NCATS really keeps track of that. There's a number of people who have downloaded it. It's not, we, we give them a, a large open source uh, data stream. Uh, all data is entered and accessed through an API. It's backend Java and Oracle, but it works with other databases. It works with Oracle, PostgreSQL, uh, MySQL, and it has a built-in H2 database. So you can almost do it cost-free. You don't have to license Oracle or or anything else that have the system. Although at FDA, we do use it with Oracle. There's a native JSON meshes that TJ mentioned that will um, that has been adapted um, to a fire message. Uh, the UI development, we're upgrading. We're constantly upgrading the system. We're going to go to Angular 2.6. We make extensive use of leucine indexes, so you have a lot of faceted searching and things like that. And at FDA, we've implemented um, uh, you know, group ones, two, and three, although we haven't really started to enter data into it, and we offer the, spe the specification part of, of, of substance group four, we have sort of a, a beta on that. We also have developed a lot of Excel tools that uh, NCATS distribute, so you can actually communicate with the database with through Excel and add names or look it up or, or things like that. They're, um, they're pretty nice. And uh, Mitch Miller, who's one of our contractors, was responsible for a lot of that, along with Tyler Perrier, who's really the principal developer of the GSRS at, uh, at NCATS, along with Danny Katzel. And then Noel Sothal has been sort of, uh, you know, managing the project at, at, uh, at, uh, at NCATS, or at, at NCATS, yeah. So how it's used at FDA, you know, we've been able to integrate it, again, because unis are used all over the place, or BDNUMs, which are the initial thing. I should have mentioned also, when we, when we provide a uni, it's really a two-step process. One person has to enter the data, then a different person has to approve the data based on a, what we think is a reliable reference source. So all the data is curated, hopefully it's correct, um, again, we every every big database has mistakes, but again, it, it's it's pretty reliable. We recently did a a test against USP structures in the USP dictionary. There were seven thousand structures. Um, I think USP we found twenty five that were wrong. We had one that was wrong. So you know we think it's a pretty reliable data set. Um, you know, industry again uses the data to find Unicode so they can do their submissions, and we hope again it will help change the whole submission process and eventually the ECDD so that a lot of this information gets instructured. Um, again, this current status, again, it works in more or less in all modern browsers. It probably Firefox and Chrome are the best. We have over 180,000 substances, but only 105 have been curated where two people have looked at it or 106. Uh, we have over uh, probably close to a million names, 800,000 codes. Um, probably close to 200,000 relationships between substances, and we link to many outside sources. We've mapped a lot to ct.gov, clinicaltrials.gov, and EU clinical trial system. We have, you know, it's based structure and sequence searching. There's a lot of faceted and advanced field searching, and again, we, we right now we're only making the NLM or the NCATS version available. In the near future, we hope to have, make the, the FDA version available to industry as well. Um, we, of course, with all the proprietary data removed. Um, and again, this is uh, where we're going. And again, we, we, we thought we'd have something by June, but it, it took a more of a rewrite to make the uh, a distributable version of the FDA so it will be easy to install. I mean, we can distribute it now, but it would be fairly difficult. We're, again, you know, this is, again, the timelines with software. Again, they always move. And this is, uh, you know, this is, um, this is what we hope. We hope that by hopefully in October we'll have a distributable version of the FDA software with, you know, 
hopefully use some product information, some adverse event information, other stuff in there. Um, and we're developing other applications off it, R, to do some statistical analysis on various things. And, you know, it's constantly under review. If you have any comments, you know, please let NCATS know, and they'll eventually get filtered to us, too. Uh, and um, uh, this is just a brief, I uh, usually I do a live demo at this point, but since this computer doesn't have access to the GSRS, um, this just shows you this, the, you know, all the things you can register, all the things you can search on. Um, this is, you know, when you're viewing all the substances, you can see we have 185,804. This is lisinopril anhydrous, and you'll notice here that all the adverse events are tied to this. Lisinopril is actually a, a dihydrate, and that's one of the problems with naming. In Europe, uh, lisinopril, this, this would be called lisinopril. And in the U.S., uh, USAN renames it. A lot of times they include the hydrate, uh, not explicitly. So our, our official name for lisinopril is actually lisinopril is actually a dihydrate. Why in Europe, the official, this would map to the, you see the, the lisinopril INN, you know, that's what they would consider it. So again, that's why names can be can be confusing and, and, and things like that. But uh, but this shows you, and then we've mapped all the adverse events. One thing our system has done is we've collapsed all the ad adverse events to the uh, active uh, active morty level, which this would be the active morty for lisinopril. Uh, this just goes to show you that the, but we have links to everything, the salts and salvates. So if you click on that button, you'd be able to see all that. Um, this just shows you, you know, we have products and adverse events. You can look at what the most common adverse events on a given substance are. Uh, you can look at the clinical trials, too. Um, this just shows you the classification. So all those blue highlighted are clickable. So if you click on one of them, you get all the other substances under that classification. And this one under ATC, cardiovascular system, acting on the ACE system, you had 17 of them. And then you can download that in a variety of formats uh, when you get the results. So there's a lot of really nice faceted browsing that's in here, and we're re constantly refining that. Um, this just shows you some of the other data. This is zidovudine. You know, we capture the metabolic enzymes for some of this stuff, the transporters that are involved. We also capture the metabolites and things like that. Um, and again, we haven't done it for everything, but we, you know, things that are public, we go look in the ClinFarm reviews at FDA, and we, we take some of this data out of there. Um, and um, again, this is just another relationship with the impurities. You, we, we capture some of the pharmacopoeial specifications on the impurities, and we're trying to get the pharmacopoeial to actually enter them in this fashion so that we work with USP and EP a little bit to, uh, so they'll capture these specifications for us, and we won't, we won't have to do that anymore. Um, so that's the system. Again, this just shows you that we have clinical trial data. Um, we have... Uh, this is the EU, just the record that we would have in EU, how they capture um, clinical trial data that we got, got out of there. Um, we have, again, adverse event data you can look at uh, in there. Um, we have, this would be our advanced search page where you can search all the things individually along with the structure. And you can, we, we allow two fields. If you put more options, you'll get, you can do a little bit of Boolean and two fields in there. Um, this just shows you the registration page. Uh, this, uh, again, is how we would register names. And you notice everything has a definition reference. Everything has access control. So sometimes, you know, we don't make names public. I mean, the name could be a company code. It's not in the public domain, even though the substance is in the public domain. So we have access control on nearly every data element and that we can control. And we want references for all the data elements as well so that we know, that, you know, sometimes we do make up names, but uh, we try to rely on other people to give us names and things like that uh, if we can. Uh, and then, of course, the structure you would enter there. This just shows we have a product registration module. It's, um, you know, it's somewhat compliant with the new IDMP. The new IDMP really gets into names. It breaks names down into a lot of fragments, and that's what we've done here. Uh, the product name, you, you can have a lot of different types of product name, and uh, they've sort of, what's the what's the proprietary name? Is there a strength in the product name? And so, I mean, it, it's a nice system. We're, we haven't really using it yet at FDA, but again, we, we made this available so other people or countries can uh, register their products. Uh, again, at the product level, the, again, this is sort of the product registration. You're able to capture all this information. You know, and then you're at a manufactured item level, and then you're able to also add the ingredients, add what the lot number is, the manufacturer date, the expiry, and the lot size, and capture all the ingredients. And there's a lot of 
ingredient types there where it can be even impurities. And, and again, in Europe, they like to um, separate the core from the internal part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the tablets and things like that. So we, we, we also have that available here. Again, we haven't really started using this, but it's, but it's something that we've, we've pretty worked out a lot. Again, we also have the ability to register applications in a certain sense. And again, we, um, we, we currently bring the applications into the GSRS, so we were able to combine CBER and CEDAR application and also CIFSAN applications that all in, in one system. Each of those systems are separate, and our system is able to bring them together to a certain extent. Uh, and again, this just shows you then you can add ingredients uh, and, and things like that here. Usually we don't capture lots and stuff like that at the, at the application level, mostly for INDs. And, and things like that. Then I just wanted to show you this other site that NCATS has developed off of the GSRS. It's the same software of the GSRS, and they've developed, and it's a nice site if you want to look at you know, biological information targets and, and, and things like that. So again, you can look at all the US approved drugs. They've done a really good job of mapping to it that may be better than our internal databases at FDA. Uh, but they've done, a, they've done a great job, and they tell you what year it got approved, and they've done a lot of work on that, and it, it, it's pretty mostly correct, we think. And, uh, and then they also have, you know, what are the biological targets or things involved and stuff. Um, but it's Insight, and it's, it's basically using GSRS software. Uh, again, this has been a real collaborative effort. These are some of the collaborators. We've had a lot of collaborators, a lot of people. I had acknowledged the slide, but it's really gotten too big. Um, in there, but a lot of people have been involved in, in this effort. It's been about a, the, GS, the SRS and then the GSRS has really been kind of almost a 10-year effort at FDA. And, um, you know, it, 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 I, I know when I came to FDA, I thought, you know, that we had a great substance database here. And, you know, and we, we sort of built a good one now. But, you know, I know companies, I've, I've worked with companies in the past. I know, you know, substance database are very important for them. And it's most regulatory agencies don't have a substance database. I even even the Germans didn't have one until now, which was kind of surprising. I thought we would use their database, to be honest with you. They're going to host the European one now. But a lot of regulatory agencies don't have this. And so, you know, we really uh, look forward to sharing it with them. That's why we went with predominantly open source software and sourceware that's freely distributable and also to make it available to companies and, and, and things like that. So um, I guess that's it. If you want to get the software, go to Tripod. We have uh, meetings and teleconference. They're usually free and open to the public. You can sign up on a notification list, and you'll get a notification from NCATS. That's their link. And then our link for getting unis uh, with NLM. We collaborate a lot with NLM, too. And uh, they, they host uh, just a, a name search uh, database uh, for uh, finding unis and, and other names and codes at, at FDA or you know, from FDA to use. Um, again, that's that's all I have to say. I guess we'll uh, entertain questions, uh, Jeff, at some point. Or, yep, yeah, that, that's absolutely <clears throat> right, Larry. We're going to take a quick break here. We're already <clears throat> reviewing uh, the questions that have been submitted so far. Uh, for those of you that have questions for Ron, TJ, Larry on any of the content that was uh, covered thus far, please use that Q&A pod in the lower right-hand <clears throat> corner to submit those. We're going to take a break uh, to review those questions as they come in, and we'll be back with answers in just a few moments.
Hello, uh, this is TJ. I'm back for some questions. Um, first, I'm going to read out some of the questions and give you the answer uh, for that. Uh, there's a question about, is the FDA going to utilize certain methodology for therapeutic classification for the drugs approved by the FDA? And the answer is yes. Um, in the past, in 1571 or the 356 H form, you provide text for the indications. Going forward, that field, that data field, split into two elements. The text still remain, but then you need to code it with no map. Um, that is for the NDA, BLA, and even in IND clinical study. Uh, you need to provide indication in SNOMED. And then there's another related question um, about what level of uh, detail on the code need to be provided. Um, because the structure of a SNOMED is not like major, there's no PT, LLT. Um, it's difficult to pin the sponsor to a certain level, but the, the guidance say the most granular level, the lowest level that is applicable. So that would be the guidance. And another question um, concerning how does NDC call conform with the country identifier in ISO 11615? So as you may remember that um, the medicinal product ID Due to the, reg the regional regulation, there will be no global MPID. However, to achieve global uniqueness, ISO 11615 specify a three segment <coughs> patterns. So you prefix with country code, followed by the marketing authorization number, followed by the product code. So for NDC code, if you prefix with US, that will make it globally unique. And so I hope that answers the question. There will be no global MPID, at least not when all of the regions start to implement MPID. OK, and there's another question about a PHP ID algorithm. Is it available for researchers to use? Um, for analyzing the FAIRS database. OK, the ISO standard is a proprietary, uh, it's a property of ISO. Um, to use the standard, you need to go to ISO website to purchase the standard. However, because we recognize that try to generate a PHP ID um, may be complicated, especially when you have product with multiple ingredients or product or combination product including devices. Um, that's why uh, WHO and UMC is put out this proposal trying to generate and maintain global PHP ID that we can download and use. So, but again, if you are interested in purchase the PHP ID algorithm, you need to go to the ISO website. And that would be the questions for me. I'm going to turn that to Larry for other questions. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, several uh, really interesting questions. Um, one, the, the first one is, when will the the FDA interface be made publicly available? I'm trying to get it as available as soon as possible to the public. Um, and again, the, the the problem is is that there were really two separate development teams, and they were trying to merge them together. But we think in October we have to do a lot of refactoring of the of the initial GSRS code, um, and then we think by October we'll have something that will be easy for people to deploy. We don't have a lot of support mechanisms, and NCATS will provide limited support, but we want to make something that's you know kind of running very simply out of the box, perhaps as a Docker image or something that can be just 
deployed readily on the cloud. Uh, we had other questions about uh, the EMA list. We do have EVMPD IDs in the system. We did that about two years ago, and the re we haven't remapped it again because, again, there's a lot of cleanup going on in the uh, in the XFBPD, and so we wanted to wait till they get done, and we're working closely with the EMA to kind of make sure we're consistent on that. And there were some substances, like a lot of the, the homeopathics that they call substances and other things that for us would be more group one specified substances, so we didn't tackle a lot of them. And sometimes, you know, the way they indicate vaccine antigens and things like that, it's not, they're not readily mappable sometimes. We have to almost look at their dossier to see where these really the two strains or the same strains and, and things like that. Um, how is uniqueness, or it says unique name identifiers, but I think they may have met, how do we define that something is unique? Well, for chemicals, we, we NCATS developed their own sort of internal system called the Lynchy, which is a little bit like the Inchy that IUPAC has, which breaks a substance up and then generates a hash code, and it's pretty robust in that, you know, things that it will catch most, most tautomers and things like that, and um, and determine that uh, you know no matter how you draw it, that the things are um, are actually unique and, and and things like that. I mean, we're always tuning it and and stuff like that, but we're pretty confident in again with with chemicals. I mean, there's always some things when you get um, some sort of tautism or isomerism where you change. I don't want to get into too many details, but when you change the hybridization on a carbon atom. It's very difficult for any of the systems to really detect that those are really the same thing. So we do a lot of that by hand. Even things like glucose are, you know, there's some issues with even something as simple as glucose. What's the real structure of glucose and things like that? Because it goes back and forth to a lot of things. Um, we don't. We used to use Weiss only line notation. That's really old, and I, I can barely understand it uh, anymore. And uh, you know, so we we really just you know go by the molecular structure, which we store mostly as a mole file. Um, there is a, a, a vague implementation guide. We're working on that, too. Again, the system's under development. There's some help and, and things like that, and we, we, we are trying to get a better implementation guide for the GSRS, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll have that within a couple of months. Um, <clears throat> the other one, um, you know, the, again, how data can be secured. Well, this is a system you can put behind your firewall. We're not... We, we, we may put up a portal for registration, but our idea is this is a system that a company can put it up behind their firewall and they can really secure secure the data as, as, as best they can. Um, and um, we, um, you know, we, 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 we hope that that's done. I mean, that's why we made a distributed system so that companies could have it themselves. Again, is there any relation between a Unicode? A Unicode is completely random and a CAS number. We do map the CAS numbers. Now, a lot of times CAS isn't that specific. I mean, for most of the racemic structures, you can't determine whether it's a racemate or unknown. So the CAS number is, is helpful, and we try to put CAS numbers in our system whenever we can find them. But we, um, we don't, um, you, know, you, you know, again, it's not our primary ID. We, we do capture them. We try to put them in for everything that we have. Um, and, um, yeah, again, the preferred substance name, again, we always go by the USAN name. If there's a USAN name available, prior to USAN name being available, we typically use the company code because that's what's out in the literature. That's what's out there so people can find what the substance is. But again, we love to have USAN and INN names. We, we don't like to make up names. There was a, a question there on making up names. And sometimes, you know, we, we have to uh, because there's no IUPAC name for the salmon. We go back and forth with the companies and say, you know, is this a good name that we can use because we want to make it publicly available. And so we always you know, bounce it off the company to make sure we're not revealing anything they, they would consider trade secret. Um, and for other things, we do sometimes invent our own names, you know, for some of the polymers or something we may put in the molecular weight a certain way and, and things like that. Um, how are unis assigned? Well, they're assigned by a, um, they're assigned by a two-step process. And, and again, it's, it's a, it, we either get them from an application, anybody can request a uni for anything. There's another question about that. You can Send us an email, a GSRS. I should have put the email address up there, but I think we'll. I, I can send it to, to Jeff so he can post it. Or you can actually submit um, a uni request through email. We're trying to get a, a more robust process for that, and whether it will become part of an ECDD process in the future. You know, that's something that uh, we're looking forward to. But again, anybody can request a uni at any time. We hope that it will be something 
related to a submission eventually to the FDA, but we really want some UNIs to be assigned um, prior to that. They're actually somewhat required in clinical trials now. If you're going to do a clinical trial in the U.S., um, there was some guidance on you know getting a UNI uh, and using that as an identifier for the um, for your, uh, your 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 exploratory compound. Um, and again, um, you know, if you have something that's new and you want us to sign it, assigning a uni doesn't mean FDA has approved it or anything else. It just means that we've defined it. So, you know, on our uni list, I mean, the inactive ingredient list is still a list of ingredients that have been used in drug products. Getting a uni, you know, we assign unis to a lot of things, um, you know, for a lot of toxic impurities, to a lot of other things. And, you know, so having a uni doesn't mean that... Uh, the FDA has in any way approved it. We just approved that you've given us enough information to define something we think unambiguously. That's um, that's really what the UNI uh, stands for. GSRS stands for the Global Substance Registration System. It, it, there is a version currently accessible to the public. I think on one of the slides that uh, Jeff has. Uh, you distribute the slides, Jeff, too? Yeah, yeah. That they you, you'll see where you can access it at the Genus Tripod site. How is this relevant to industry? I don't know. I mean, you know, I think it's relevant to industry. I think knowing what the substance is and having a system like this, if you're a small business, I mean, you can pay millions of dollars to get a system that, you know, in my personal opinion, you know, may or may not be as good as what we, we're giving you for nothing. And, uh, you know, so again, it's uh, when we, we, we did actually put a bid out on the street for developing this and it came back pretty, pretty high. Um, and again, we love to have corrections. If you see any corrections, um, you know, in the in, in, in our system, you know, please you can send me a personal email to my lawrence.callahan at fda.hhs, and we'll we'll certainly correct it. Um, and um, anybody, um, again, uh, um, uh, let me see what else do we have here. And the EMA is going to, you know, they're they're using the same criteria for determining uniqueness, whether they use the same code or whether they modify the code, that's still under discussion. But again, there, there'll be certainly just a one-to-one -one mapping to any EMA substance to the U.S. substance because they're using the same system, the same criteria for defining uh, defining things. Okay. Um, you know, again, we, for therapeutic, uh, pharmacological and therapeutic classification, we don't really do that in the GSRS, we just take it from other systems. FDA has their established pharmaceutical class when something gets approved. We make that available. We also capture a number of other classifications. NCI has a nice classification system. The ATC system and NDFRT, we all carry that with the substance if we can map it to a single substance. Um, let's see. Um, uh, you know, again, uh, um, can the GSRI be requested and implemented? Yeah, again, we hope to, to make the system available uh, to the public. I don't know. I think I've answered most of them here that we have. And, and again, if you have any further questions, you can shoot me an email, and I'll, I'll try to answer it as well. Um, and, um, and that's, uh, let's see. Um, Hold on <coughs> just a second. We're going to take a look at some of the questions that uh, just came in and review those. We'll be right back on air. And
Yeah, hi. Uh, one, one question I didn't answer before that uh, we, we probably should address is how we think the ECDD process can change. And I think some of the change is already underway in, at FDA. I think they published um, a preliminary guidance on PQCMC to get that data structured. But we think there's a lot of data in the ECDD that could be structured. Um, and again, and again, it would be stages of structuring. For instance, when an IND, initial IND comes in the door for a phase one trial, we'd certainly like to have the active ingredient, and then we pretty much mapped an active moiety, to have that already defined and assigned to uni, perhaps even prior to, to uh, submitting the IND, either if you're doing a meeting with FDA or something like that, so we know what that is and we can, you know, be a little bit educated on it. As we get further along, we'd love to get a lot of the preclinical pharmacology, you know, structured into the in, in, in the ECDD. There's, you know, we always get on small molecules typically a SIP profile. You know, is the is the substance is it an is it a substrate of an, a SIP enzyme? Is it an inducer or is it an inhibitor? And that's very important information and in, in vitro information. And it will sort of give us a hint on possible drug to drug interactions. And we'd love to get a lot of the clinical pharmacology data structured, which we currently, you know, get it in various formats, sometimes in sentences, sometimes in tables, things like that. But I think that can be structured. And, and again, a lot of the ECD process, when I even talk to my industry colleagues, it, it's a tremendous amount of effort. They, they really are starting oftentimes with structured data and somewhat destructuring it or putting it in PDFs to give to us. And uh, it would be better to get it, you know, initially structured all the way from the beginning. There's efforts in industry like the allotrope effort where they're really trying to get consistent characterization data or analytical data and you know getting that raw data would sometimes be great to see um, for things. So we think that's you know where something can, that can come in. Initially when you know metabolites and you know their important metabolites to get an ID for that where we know it. Impurities, probably impurities you know until you get ready to file or something like that, we probably, you know, we wouldn't maybe want all your impurities registered, but when you're certainly filing or this is going to be a, a, a thing, we'd love to get all the impurities registered and then have the impurity table would actually have a unicode so we know what the actual impurity is if you characterize it fully and if you haven't at least, you know, what the relative retention time or mass spec or something would be. So, you know, we think there's a lot of information in the ECD that can be structured. We think it would benefit both the FDA and industry and uh, we really look forward to doing it, you know, uh, uh, certainly first, you know, uh, in sort of a trial basis or, or, or things like that, and then uh, hopefully eventually, you know, to change the whole ECDD. It takes a long time to change something like that because it's an ICH process. And um, But we think, you know, the whole thing should be changed. Uh, I think one of the lowest hanging fruit is the formulations. You know, we should get the formulations in structured, you know, SPL doesn't require amounts of inactive ingredients, and we that that would be a, a very low hanging fruit that would help us a great deal, and not to have to hire people to re-enter formulations, and perhaps sometimes it's even difficult on some of these uh, inactive ingredients to determine what it actually is, and and things like that, and so um so that's I I think the ECD is is really um, a, a place where we could do um do a lot to, to help the regulatory process and also help industry in, in submissions and drug development in general. How does it applicable to clinical trial materials? Well, we, of course, you know, we want to know what's been in clinical trials. And um, in a lot of times, you know, clinical trials aren't initially done in the U.S. And it's always good to know. I mean, there's been, a, you know, a number of incidents in clinical trials. And when they go bad, it gets public sometimes. And, um, you know, we, we want to know and prevent that. I, there's a, a number of incidents I can call to mind that where, you know, the same substance or metabolite, that substance was tested two or three times and you got the same pretty drastic adverse events. And so I think it's very important. And again, there's an obligation to the community too. When you're doing a clinical trial, society has to benefit in general on it that, you know, and if you don't tell us what you use in the clinical trial material, that data just disappears. And there's a lot of clinical trial that we don't even know what the substance was. If it was done, you know, somewhere else in the world, um, and, you know, we, we can't figure out what it was. And, um, you know, so I think it's very important to, um, to, you know, when you go trials in humans that there's an, uh, there, there should be almost an obligation to, 
and so a lot of companies are doing that now, but some aren't. And I think there should be an obligation to make what the actual material that you're using in the clinical trial public. Again, that's my personal opinion. That's not certainly on an FDA policy, and uh, and, and that's uh, you know that's uh, where I'd leave it off. I know if TJ wanted to answer an, another question. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, go ahead. So there's a question said, would you consider that the using of SNOMED CT for indication disease term are ISO IDMP compatible? So in ISO IDMP, um, the 11615 MPID standard, Section 7.9 mentioned about indication, and there's a note that for the regional uh, regulator uh, can further develop to acquire additional information. So we consider this is compatible. Um, ISO does not say which, which, uh, which terminology system should be used for indication. So the answer to that we will say yes, it's compatible. Thank you to all of our speakers for your very informative and timely talk and also for responding to the questions that came in. A few closing reminders. This activity is eligible for continuing education by RAPS, SOCRA, SQA, and ACRP. Please refer to our website at fda.gov forward slash CDRSBIA for more details.